Am I not being, uh, am I not posing correctly for you, Carson? No, no, this side. There we go. Anyway, uh, where's the horse head and the chicken head? Are they there? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Things I don't like, I mean, I wake up and I check Twitter to see what happened the night before. Did anybody get shot or anything like that? And then I see the picture of the, the horse and the chicken fight <laughs> in the lobby with the hotel security breaking it up. I'm like, oh, that's, that's good. Good job, guys. Or gals, I don't know. It's, I don't know who's really into the, the, that kind of thing. Um, so some administrative stuff. Seriously, if you haven't seen that, you should check Twitter. It's pretty. It's a pretty epic. Because there's two hotel security, and it's a nice photo. There's good bokeh in the back and everything. It's very well framed. It's just two people wearing livestock costumes fighting. <laughs> um, we're still selling T-shirts. Please, God, if you haven't bought a T-shirt, go buy a T-shirt. Because I hate taking them home. Uh, the 15 bucks each cash donation to EFF or Hackers for Charity will be shutting that down here shortly. Uh, so please go do that. I think we also will be selling a few bags, things I also hate taking home. Um, it turns out that we have a lot of previous year swags and like onesie twosie, like a box here, a box there. And after nine years, I have a lot of boxes here and there of random stuff. So we're happy for you to take the historical documents home with you and for me not to keep them. Um, please send in feedback, go to the feedback website. Um, any way, shape, or form, we take your feedback. You can provide feedback on Twitter, and that's cool and all, but it's really a bitch to track. So please email it to us. We don't like having to dig through Twitter unnecessarily. Um, and Ted's still selling DVDs. He's out here today. Please buy DVDs if you're interested. Keep Ted driving across the country for us and coming out here and filming us and giving all our stuff to us royalty-free and letting us post it on the intertubes. We'll be ripping his DVDs here at some point and getting it all posted online for you, too. Um, any other announcements I'm supposed to make? Is there any of the Shibukan staff here? Check. We're going to start. Um, so here's the deal. We started this uh, um, idea a few years ago where when we're reviewing papers in the uh, CFP queue, we find trends. You know, people want to talk about the same thing or similar topics. Um, and uh, Sometimes, you know, the, the topic seems very, um, I guess, topical, current, trending, um, hashtag cool. Um, and so what we uh, decided to do, we decided to do a number of years ago, is uh, take the topics that kind of all had something in common and glue them together and make a panel out of it, which in some respects is a little rude of the program committee to basically be like, hey, that was um, a good talk. We maybe have accepted it, but what we'd rather do is you to do something completely different. Um, and so far, nobody's rebelled, uh, which has been nice. I, I do get a little nervous when I start telling people what we'd rather have them do than what they thought they wanted to do. Um, this year's topic, um, I think, is an interesting uh, one, given especially some of the stuff that's come out in the last few weeks. Um, we're going to talk about information sharing. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting. I mentioned this during the, the opening. You know, there was a State of the Union a couple of days ago, and... Obama released his, you know, statement on cybersecurity, right? This huge document talks about cybersecurity. What was the first point? Share all the things, right? Information sharing. So from the executive office's perspective, sharing information is the most important thing we can do to secure our national infrastructure. True, false? I don't know. Um, it's hard to share information, though, for a wide variety of reasons, um, both technical and political and, uh, quite frankly, straight up operational. So what we're going to do today is kind of explore that a little bit with our panelists. So uh, from right to left, we have Ron Ritchie uh, with uh, Bank of America. He actually uh, identifies himself with Bank of America, which is fantastic. Um, um, ben Miller, Jesus, with... Yes, I said. You just, you can... Sorry, ESI set. There we go, all right. <laughs> you know, so here's the deal. Um, I drank wine out of a bag last night. <laughs> um, and I'm, 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 I would say hungover, but I think I was still kind of hammered when I got up. Uh, I don't drink much. <laughs> it was quite the shock to the system. So I'm way out of sorts. In a few minutes, food is going to be delivered to me, and I'm going to eat in the middle of this panel. I will apologize right now. Um, and so I'm just going to let these two guys introduce themselves, and then Ron's going to kick off the panel. They're each going to do um, a, kind of a little bit of an opening statement. Um, I'm going to throw uh, probably the crust at them, because I don't like the crust. Um, and then we will uh, open it to questions and have a grand dialogue. So, um. 
All right. Um, my name is Doug Wilson. Uh, I work at Mandiant. I manage our group that does threat indicators. I'm Sean Barnum with MITRE. Um, lead a lot of the community efforts around structured threat information and uh, representations. I don't think Sean's mic is hot. Wow. Oh, or he's bringing it up. Is it hot? Is that better? Yeah. Sorry, I'll, lean, I'll bring it forward, Clark. Sorry, Sean Barnum with MITRE. So involved in a lot of the community efforts around uh, information representations uh, to solve some of these problems. So. Start with Ron. Oh, go for it. All ready to go. Yeah, so again, my name's Ron Ritchie. I'm the Chief Scientist for Information Security at Bank of America. Uh, and one of the uh, things that we spent a lot of time just um, really since I've joined about a year ago uh, is looking at information sharing and, and really what's working, what's not working. Um, th there's a lot that is, is working, but there's a huge amount of, of work to do. And I want to make a few comments around, you know, really why we should care and what are, are some of the things that are happening right now, uh, but also talking about some of the challenges that we feel as an organization. Um, there's a, a, a large amount of, of uh, desire uh, and acknowledgement that information sharing is needed. Uh, the things that we recently saw with the U.S. and the EU uh, coming forward and, and making some pretty strong declarative statements around the need for information sharing, uh, I, I think is a very positive step. And they're, by the way, mainly talking about their ability to share with, with the uh, private communities. I mean, they're talking about providing their data to us, uh, as well as providing a legal framework uh, to allow us to share our data with, with each other. Um, but that's already happening right now today. I mean, we're already sharing information, so why is there this still pent-up need, this pent-up demand for doing it different, doing it better? And, and the thing is, we're not getting a huge amount of value out of the information sharing that we're doing so far. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of my co-panelists uh, will, will get into a lot of the, the technical details around that. But, uh, but I would say that the biggest challenge is that we haven't figured out how to action the information that we've got uh, even internally to our own organizations, the information that we've got internally, we're, we're still having some challenges. But when I try to send that data to other people who might be able to benefit from it, we still haven't figured out how to make that data truly actionable. And so just saying that we need to share information is not enough. We need to have a reason that we're sharing data, and we need to have a plan for using the data. And that's still work that, that we haven't quite baked. Um, so right now, you know, kind of the state of the art, if you will, for information sharing, uh, state of the art is not the right term, it's really the state of play, is it's like the friends and family network. You know, people meet uh, in, in communities, they develop trust, and they start sharing, and that sharing is often happening through email. Uh, you can imagine how robust the uh, data exchange formats are in email. Um, we, we get, you know, laundry lists of suspect IPs. Uh, that uh, groups that we're doing business with might think that we should worry about, whether it's command and control servers, whether it's botnet uh, members, and, and so on. Um, that, that data is interesting. It's useful in a very short uh, context. Uh, but without understanding really what the provenance and the context around that data is, it has a very, very short lifespan of, of usability. Uh, when we get into more advanced uh, types of information sharing, looking at indicators of compromise, you know, again, it gets e even worse. A lot of the indicators that we're collecting are pretty fragile uh, and are very easy to route around from the adversary's perspective. And so we're really looking at trying to figure out as an organization what can we provide out to the industry that they might be able to take advantage of. And if information is provided to us, how do we get it in a format? And how do we get it in a, a content that allows us to actually make real world changes to the protective stance that we have as an organization. Because our, our belief is that we're not just protecting our organization, we're protecting an entire sector, and it's a very important sector. We consider ourselves part of the critical infrastructure. So we are trying to figure out not only how do we protect Bank of America, but how do we protect Citibank? You know, how do we protect uh, Wells Fargo? How do we protect all of the smaller banks as well that are out there? And so we are very interested in this space and very interested in seeing better information exchange, but it's got to be driven based on actionable intelligence that we have a plan to use. And so really that's, that's our viewpoint. 
Thanks. So um, a quick note on the constitution of the panel while we switch the microphone over. Um, the idea here is, um, you know, Ron's got this the viewpoint from the financial services industry. Um, they have a relatively robust understanding of risk. Um, they spend a lot of money on IT, and they're kind of in some regards at the pointy end of the spear when it comes to some of these problems. Uh, uh, ben, your background is more um, uh, energy focus, uh, the, the energy sector, uh, critical infrastructure protection, uh, but doesn't necessarily have kind of the same pointy IT capability, if you will. There's SCADA um, and other things floating around as they have a large trail that they have to deal with. But on the flip side, we understand the critical nature of the energy uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, we have Doug, who, you know, his organization deals with, you know, threats and, and real attacks all the time, and they see this and they see the need to share. Um, and, and then we've got Sean from MITRE who's trying to wrap some structures, as, as it sounds like, you know, um, Ron has indicated is needed. Now the challenge and, uh, to everyone in the audience as you listen to the rest of the opening remarks is uh, we may have constructed an echo chamber on stage, uh, right? I mean, these are all people who believe strongly and this is something that's important and here's the way to do it and whatever. So um, be thinking critically as we go down the rows of, you know, the different viewpoints that each of these people bring to the table and how to apply it or not apply it in your enterprise. So when we get to questions, hopefully we get some good, good things rolling. So. All right. So I'm Ben Miller. I work for the ES ISAC. I, and does anyone know what an ISAC is? Because that's actually pretty good. So an ISAC is an information sharing analysis center, uh, which is trying to be a clearinghouse for the sector, in my case the electricity sector, on sharing of information between the uh, members of that industry, as well as kind of being the glue between the government as well. So we work closely with government on what they're seeing and what they're sharing with us. We distribute that to our community, and we also distribute things that's all being seen in the community to the rest of the community so everyone can learn from each other. A lot of those, I think, uh, fall under the pretense of indicators of compromise through our information, that sort of thing. So I'm not really an instant response person anymore. I, I was in a prior life. Now I consider myself a coordinator of instant response teams, uh, a facilitator for one instant response team to talk to another that is seeing similar things and try and connect the dots at a sector level. And with that, uh, there's certain challenges, right? So Ron mentioned the, the trust with friends and family, and a lot of what I'm trying to do is create trust of people who don't know each other and, and generate that trust to an extent where person A, well, group A, We'll talk to group B uh, and has that trust enough with, uh, and boot that group B will not then rat out group A, for instance. Uh, and at the same token, there's a very diverse uh, capability set amongst my sector. So you might have a Fortune 100 company that has a team of 12 that's doing instant response, has their SOC, and is on top of things. And then you have someone who's in rural America who, who uh, is the engineer for their IT, for the electricity system, for the water system, and everything else, and he uh, is uh, just doing the security thing on the side uh, during the night. So, so how do you how do you create a baseline of functionality where some an analyst at a network operations center can talk to that guy in an intelligent way where they can share information? And that's uh, certainly a struggle within the sector. Um, one of the, the big things uh, to actionable information that uh, Ron was talking about, the, the community in general will ask the question, uh, say if, if I give them uh, an attack that happened that included 10 indicators. One of those was an MD5, one was an IP address, a URL, a domain, et cetera. And they say, great, what do I do with this? Uh, so what I would recommend there is if you think of the, the types of data that you're dealing with, an IP address, a domain, uh, an MD5, each of those different types has a value associated with it to you as an organization. So an MD5, if you don't have visibility into all of your, your executables on your network, for instance, which a lot of people don't, an MD5 is not very valuable. IP address may be valuable if you can throw it in your firewall, throw it into uh, other systems, and you can do that analysis. So if you think of it from a visibility versus time standpoint, if you have visibility of something that happened in the past, that's great. Uh, that, that has a certain value. If you have visibility of something that's happening now or in the future, then that's great because then you can actually do real-time detection or real-time response. 
Uh, and if you have both of those, then you uh, have a multiplier. So if there were three areas I would focus on if you were to create a spreadsheet and figure out what you need to do with these types of indicators. On one axis, you have the types of indicators, and on another axis, you have all of your data sources, your firewall, your AV, your uh, spam quarantine, everything listed. And you figure out which one of these can I create a process around, which one of these can I issue a ticket to the NOC where they will uh, put the IP address in a block list. Uh, but in, in addition to that, you also need to keep a repository of all your previous forensics investigations that you've done, right? Because then when you can use your MD5. Now, forensics guys love MD5s. Everyone produces an MD5 because it's the easiest thing you could possibly do to describe that piece of malware. Uh, so use th those sorts of indicators also in your investigations or in your prior investigations so you can actually answer the question, have we seen this before? Is this a known known? Uh, and at the same time, review your log. So if you're seeing, if you receive these indicators, have you seen it before you just didn't know it was part of this thing, as well as uh, doing the, the uh, real-time analysis, plugging into your IDS and your detection, your monitoring systems, your prevention systems, uh, so that you have the actual information of if the attack comes around again or uh, a slightly a similar attack that's using same domains or other things that you can actually uh, get notified immediately. Uh, and that's really, I think, where I was going to focus it, turn it over to Doug. Actually, I think Tom was going to go oh, next. Sorry. Okay. next. Um, <clears throat> so I've spent um, most of my time the last uh, few years working with communities um, trying to tackle the technical challenges around this, this problem. So communities in the cyber threat intel space, so threat intel cells, C-certs, SOCs, um, you know, reversers, uh, forensics, these kind of guys. Um, to try and see, you know, what are the challenges, if you want to try and share stuff, what, how do we get through those challenges? Um, so the challenges we're talking about are, you know, first of all, what I refer to as the Tower of Babel problem. So if you want to actually share something with somebody else today, um, depending on who you want to share it with, there's, you know, hundreds to thousands of different ways to talk about that. So within a given or any organization represents this sort of stuff one way, each tool is representing it one way, sensors are representing it a way. Even if you're working within an, an existing community, such as the ESI SAC or the FSI SAC and those kind of things, they each have their own way of talking about this. And the reality is that the value of sharing is not simply two people sharing with each other. The value is any given organization sharing in multilateral. So they might be sharing with five different communities or sets of players. And that Tower of Babel problem becomes a real problem that the, the short amount of cycles we have with analysts are spending an inordinate amount of time right now just trying to translate from the various formats and things to try and understand what they have so they can then do analysis and make decisions off of it. So number one, that's one of the big technical, technical challenges in, in making things practical for exchange. Similarly, most of the stuff, as, as Ron said, that's getting exchanged today is being exchanged in prose. This is an email going from player to player or, or a portal or in the worst case, all caps PDFs from certain organizations that generate stuff. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is even harder because now you have to, you can't really automate that. Somebody, some human has to think through it, read it, determine that it's important, and then pull stuff out they care about. So automation is one of the other challenges. And then also, um, one of the barriers that's a political barrier to some degree um, that's barring sharing being more effective is typically today, because everything's conflated together, if I want to share with you the things that are going to be useful to you, in many cases, I have to share things that I don't want to share. I don't want to share with you the instance of how I was breached, what the details were. I don't want to sit, show you your, my sources and methods. So how do we actually deconflate those things so that we can share the indicators that are going to be valuable for you but also not share the things we don't want to? And then lastly is once you decide what you want to share and who you want to share it with, how do you actually exchange that back and forth? As, as Ron said, mail is not exactly a, a, a well-scalable approach to doing that. So how do you do that kind of stuff? So a lot of the work that's been going in the community is focused on trying to those, overcome those technical challenges. So the community that I've been working with um, is a fairly broad set of players um, in commercial industry. So, you know, big companies, so some of the, the financial sector uh, companies, you know, the GEs, the USAAs, um, Visa, um, a lot of um, sharing communities. So the ISACs, Ben is with the ESI SAC, but also FSI SAC, um, ICSI SAC, RUN ISAC, so education, industrial control, those kind of areas. Um, a lot of vendors in this space that are looking to do, um, looking to uh, align their products together with other vendors, looking to provide better service to customers for doing some of the stuff. Um, government, a broad range of government players. Um, so that's not only the, the, the traditional, when we talk about this stuff, people get worried about, ooh, industry sharing with government. Government needs to share with government in a consistent way um, to do things better. Imagine that. 
Um, and then as we want, as the things that you're seeing the last couple of weeks is they're wanting more stuff to flow on from the high level of classification that the government has some unique capabilities and visibility in this stuff. And they need to share, be able to share more stuff with commercial players. How do we do that in a consistent way so that it's actually actionable for the, for the commercial players? Um, so this community, and then there's international players involved too, NATO, um, uh, CERTEU, a lot of those players. Um, so the two efforts that are around this stuff that, that are going on specifically for this um, are STIX and TAXI. STIX stands for the Structured Threat Information Expression, and I'll be spending most of the, the remainder of my comments talking about that. Um, and then TAXI. TAXI stands for the Trusted Automated Exchange of Indicator Information. Yes, I know, they're, they're cheesy acronyms. Um, not yet. Um, so TAXI is, I'll, I'll just do a very brief statement of TAXI. STIX is a language for talking about cyber threat information. Taxi is a set of specifications for defining a set of services, message flows, and then binding to certain protocols such that if we decide we want to share, how do we actually do that in an automated fashion, a trusted fashion? So Taxi is kind of a set of pipes that people can share between. And Styx is the main payload for Taxi, which is how do you actually characterize what you want to talk about? Um, so what is Styx? You can go ahead and throw the, the picture up. I'm, gonna try I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, obviously, in the opening comments. There's, there's more stuff we can dig into. If you, or you can go dig into or happy to answer more questions offline. Um, but Styx is <laughs> yeah, scaling. scaling problem. Yeah, that one's okay. Um, That's what you get on Sundays, all right? Yeah. <laughs> so Styx is a language for characterizing cyber threat information. It's not a program. It's not telling you what you should share, who you should share with. It's not a system. It's not a reposit, it's not the global threat repository, you know, it's not the government sucking up your data. It is merely a language that says, if you want to talk about, with each other about cyber threat information, how do you do it in a consistent way so you're talking apples to apples? And this diagram is the, the overall um, architecture for Stix as it exists right now, which the reason I'm gonna just show it up here so you can see visually, kind of the way that the community is thinking about this. So when we say cyber threat information, what, what, what does that mean? Because it means, when you say information sharing, that's about the most ambiguous term you can use. What kind of information are you sharing with who, how? This is scoping the problem a little bit more. So when we talk about cyber threat information, we're talking about things like observables, um, which are traditionally the kind of stuff that Ben was talking about. You know, hey, IP addresses and URLs and domains and file hashes. Um, in this case, it's going much beyond that. It's also describing everything from systems and processes and mutexes and network flows and connections and all the kinds of things you want to do. Things that are observable in the cyber domain. And, and here, going beyond the static, not just those things, but also actions and events and how they correlate. In fact, you can express the composite type things that, that um, were discussed of being missing. You know, those simple things are really easy for the adversary to get around. How do we get more meaningful things? Um, it can describe both instances, so I saw exactly this, or patterns, the things you might want to look for. And those patterns really become the basis of the indicator construct within Styx, which is you might want to look for this kind of a thing but not just in the traditional fashion of here's an IP watch list, what the hell does it mean? How do we assign context to it? When you see this, it might indicate that this adversary behavior is going on, this TTP. You can define the time window, you can define what to do about it, you can actually in the construct and sticks, you can pass um, proprietary representations. So if you're passing an indicator using the Cybox, um, which is the observable construct here, you can also pass along, you know, uh, open IOC, because you, you use mirror in your back end, you want to pump that stuff in, you can pass along snort rules for stuff, you can pass across Yara rules or oval checks. That kind of stuff. Um, also, incidents, which is a pretty obvious one here. Uh, it basically provides a context um, and a construct for capturing information around incidents using the same underlying representations and architecture and information things so that all this stuff can hook together. All the different buckets on this architecture are separable. You can deal with each one, but they're also tied together if you want to use any set of them, you can. TTP allows you to describe things like behaviors, attacker actions, as attack patterns, malware characterization, exploits resources as far as tools or infrastructure being used, victim targeting, who are they going after, specific organizations, types of organizations, people. Um, exploit targets is a construct that captures the things about us that are being targeted, vulnerabilities, weaknesses, configurations, these sorts of things. Courses of action allows you to find course of action, whether those are remedial against things that we know about ourselves or in response to incidents. Um, threat actors gives a construct for characterizing who the players are that the adversaries were talking about individuals, organizations, relationships between those, maybe you have incomplete information, you don't know who it is, but you have some information about them, and over time, you can evolve better attribution. And then lastly, campaigns, which is a meta construct about sets of incidents or sets of TTP that were observed, believed to be sa the same threat actors playing for some purpose. So you can start to bring these things together. So Styx is a language that provides schematic structures for capturing these different types of information, and allows you to combine them. So if all you care about is indicators, you can do that. 
If you're doing attribution site, you can do campaigns and threat actors, but allows you to tie that together when you're talking about a threat actor, what TTP they've used, you can do that in a consistent fashion. And so it's, it's not only providing an overall, you know, somebody who's looking whole picture, but it allows you to tie together the people that are doing malware reversing, with the people that are doing forensics, with the people that are doing attribution, with the people that are doing socks and operational stuff that need to put this in play. How do we let those players talk in the same language? So it's, that's, that's as far as I'll go down the hall. But really, overall, the goal of this effort to do this kind of stuff is, is targeted at those challenges I was talking about. So, you know, providing a common language so we can overcome the Tower of Babel. So when people are talking about this stuff, when you have stuff coming in from multiple places, how do you represent it in one way such that you can do synthesis, so you can do further analysis, you can have interoperability between tools, and so that you can exchange information with people in a way that they're going to understand? And then how do we allow that structured representation of these things to enable better automation, to be able to deconflate and be able to share just an indicator without sharing the incident information, these sorts of things? So overall, really, uh, I, I encourage you, if this is something that um, fits into what you do, um, please check it out. I, you know, we're, I'm happy to answer questions on the panel here too, but please go check it out. Um, if you, this, a good starting point is sticks.mitre.org. Um, there's white papers, there's hooks to the actual stuff. There's also GitHub sites. Um, but overall, our goal, so my goal in working with this community, is the value of the stuff that we're doing is completely relevant or uh, it's directed by the amount of input we get. So we'd love to have your perspectives, not just for you to use this stuff, but please give us your perspectives on which things you think are valuable, where the gaps are, um, so we can refine this stuff and make it more valuable. Sean? Douglas? Um, do you mind if the podium? Or? You no, know, you can use the podium. Yeah. You cool. can even drop my I, picture. I, I feel I like can't see like half of the room. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, and, uh, yeah, it's not. So plus, well. this has been surprisingly unranty for ShmooCon, so I need to change that. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so my name is Doug. I work for Mandiant. Um, we got together a little ahead of time because we realized that we often speak about a lot of the same things, so we kind of diced up the areas of what we were gonna talk about today, because um, we didn't want to tell you the same thing four times over. Um, at Mandiant, we've used some of the things you've heard up here internally to power our business process for years. I'm not gonna bore you about that, though. I will do our plug, OpenIOC, which Sean mentioned, that's sort of our standard for depicting indicators of compromise. I'll stop there, you can <coughs> Google it. Um, when we are putting this panel together, though, um, you know, we talked about this, and so we've got a very large financial organization with lots of resources. We have an information sharing organization between a lot of big companies. We have a professional service organization that really highly focuses on security and does this every day. And we have a federally funded think tank. Bruce is like, why would most people at ShmooCon care? Like seriously, like, I expect this to be his first question so I'm gonna forestall <laughs> it. Is he, he, he challenged me, he's like, show me why this matters to like the average hacker. Um, I especially want to call out, he's probably like passed out somewhere, the guy who during the uh, Friday night panel and they mentioned defense, he's like, defense sucks! I'm like, is that guy here still? Anyone? No, darn. <laughs> um, all right, so the thing is, yeah, I mean, our attitude in this industry about defense is really defeatist. Everything's broken, right? Um, so we can just pick up our ball and go home or we can try and manage that stuff. And honestly, like, I've looked at a lot of ways. I did application security for a while. I did OWASP. I was saying, oh, SQL injection. Let's protect against SQL injection. We're still doing like 12 years later. Um, in a lot of ways, defense is hard. Defense is really hard. And I'm not going to spend my time ranting on that either. But I think that what we have assembled here is something that changes that whole, the math equation has always been way in favor of the attacker. There's too many attackers, too many easy ways, not enough defenders, yada, yada. We're starting to talk about something here that actually changes the equation when we do information sharing. And so honestly, I don't think we have to accept the status quo. I think we can manage what we've got here. And by starting to share information amongst each other, we can actually change how we do security. Um, the guy who's there is probably shouting, defense sucks. This whole like attack is sexy. Attack is passe. It's not a zero day anymore, it's an every day. That's what we've taken to call them around the office because they're not new. You just have them, you accept that they're <coughs> there. Um, I think much like Somebody, who, I mean, there's still some reverse engineers and people out there and like people who pull stuff apart and find crazy exploits. They are badass. I will never be them. But actually, I think it's much sexier now to see somebody put out their research on the cool thing that they just discovered. This piece of malware that's possibly the tip of a giant conspiracy that a government actor put out there or a Russian cybercrime syndicate or a Russian cybercrime syndicate that's being paid by a government actor. I mean, that to me is what the new sexy should be. It's not like, hey, I found a new exploit. It's like, Holy cow, I found this piece of malware and look at all this stuff that's behind it. Look at all these things that are doing and by sharing that information, I'm helping everybody here do something about that. So um, I think we sort of need to do two things in the more like hacker community side of things. 
Uh, I think we need to uh, make more accessible tools, and we need to try and adjust some attitude, which is hard with this crowd, um, so bear with me. Um, so there are standards. There's, you know, Sean has a pile of XML. I've got a pile of XML. Various other people have piles of XML. Um, none of us are right yet. We're still figuring this out. But we are seeing value when you standardize how you communicate. And it's interesting because, like a lot of computer science things, this is a problem that has been solved before in other arenas. When you start mapping it back, you're like, oh, duh. I mean, these are people, I'm assuming a lot of you work with code every day. If you were trying to write programs, you didn't have standardized references, libraries, APIs, how would you communicate with other people? We're just asking you to do the same thing with threat intelligence right now. And so a lot of people are like, oh, it's confusing, it's hard, you don't have good reference out there. We're trying, we're building this stuff, we're putting stuff on websites, we're sharing it, we're making it out there, we're writing better documentation. Ours is not the best right now, I'm trying to fix that. Um, but realistically, when you're out there exploring the space of trying to find stuff out, trying to do this new research, and again, to me, looking at the bad stuff you found in a box is much more exciting than, yes, I can find a way to break Windows, Adobe, Java, you know, the list just kind of goes on and on. We know that. Someone else will do it tomorrow. Someone else will do it the next day. Find a really cool way to defend. There you go. That would be cool. And then find a way to communicate. That's awesome. So, um, and, and so people are like, okay, yeah, you, you, you sell a product though. You're talking about open IOC. How do I use that outside of Mandiant's products? Well, that is kind of a problem. We have a situation where with the stuff we've come up with, we have the equivalent of snort signatures, but no snort. <laughs> kind of a problem, right? And everyone's like, well, you're a vendor. You sell a product. Yeah, we sell a product, use IOCs in our product, and that product really is what scales us across an enterprise. But you know what, the internal thinking that we've done, and a lot of what we do before it gets pushed into product, and the product developers and all this timeline get it, we're sitting there with some of the free tools we've got, and Python scripts. Like, that's how we do our thinking internally, and we prototype new things. You're starting to see this now, finally. I mean, we've been doing it because people have paid us to do it for a while, but there's other people out there. Um, end of last year, there was this guy, um, make sure I get his name right, Jeff Briner, presented this thing at EnergySec, this thing called Pi IOC. It took our open standard and nothing else related with Mandia, and he was checking Windows boxes in his enterprise for indicators of compromise. Completely open source thing. Um, a bunch of other people out there have basically started publishing stuff. You know, here's our malware reports, here's our various other things. They do all the analysis, and then they just drop a file in one of the standardized formats. Some of them are using IOC, some of them are using other stuff. But it's just one extra step of work. But if you're somebody who ingests that standardized format instead of having to read through the PDF or the document, all this other stuff, you can pick up that file, you can hand it to a computer, and the computer can know what it's doing without having to worry about translation or transcription or confusion between what people are saying. And you're seeing this out there. Alien Vault, if anyone's familiar with them and their malware bulletins, they drop stuff out there. ForensicsArtifacts.com has started doing this. Again, to me, this is something that people who do computers should understand the value as a standardized way of communicating and explore it, learn about it, put out a little bit of effort and start doing that when you do defensive research and share your communications in that manner. So the attitude thing. Um, two problems I see in that, there's this attitude of, it's all of the big companies, corporations, money, government, the little guy can't contribute, and also large entities are always out to get you, which may be a risky statement with this crowd. Um, these days, so much of your data is out there, so many things are crowdsourced, and you, like everyone's like, oh, I don't wanna share my information to this person because it's got security implications and risk. Um, I know it's a bad word, but use antivirus, right? Who's getting an antivirus subscription from a centralized antivirus vendor? Who's getting an anti-spam service that has a centralized intelligence feed of anti-spam? Who's using an IDS or an IPS that subscribes to things like snort signatures or other dynamically updated stuff? This is all exchange of threat information. It's just we're looking at a much more complicated picture now where we're trying to put the whole process of incident response and manage an incident response into a threat feed. That's really complicated. We're not going to get there overnight. But this resistance to saying, I can't share because it might be liable or it might embarrass me or all this other stuff, we've done this fight over and over again every couple years with each type of security product that comes out. You have them running in enterprise today, you submit crash reports back to people, you submit uh, heuristics data back to people. It's going on right now. It's just you've accepted it with those vendors because they fought that battle a couple years ago. We're just doing the next most complicated one right now. Um, and so also there's this idea, um, again, libertarian anarchists out there are gonna probably start throwing schmoo also this, but um, you know, I too am uncomfortable with government or large bodies of having lots and lots of information and doing stuff with it. But at the same time, there's people in the government for years who are crying in frustration because they can see data going across the Pacific from all sorts of United States companies and they can't do anything about it because they're being law-abiding and the law says you cannot share this information. 
Um, we had some interesting discussions in the past week in uh, Suits and Spooks and like the testimony on the Hill earlier this week, talking about the fact that like everyone's protecting personal information. Most of what you have to share for threat information is not somebody's social security number. That's not what we're tracking the bad guys by. There's a different set of artifacts that we're going to be using to hunt down bad guys versus what people want to protect for their personal needs. And there are things people don't want to share. You don't want to necessarily admit you've been owned. You don't want to necessarily have the name of your company sitting in an indicator. We have to deal with that on a regular basis for our customers. But there are so many things that could be shared. And a lot of people in the government, I know the government, we're here to help. It's a joke. But like, there are a lot of people in the government who, if they could be sharing information, uh, with companies out there right now would hopefully be able to stop a lot of the intellectual property theft that's been going on. So um, what we, we do have this new executive order. We have some other legislation up there. I know CISPA is a dirty word for a lot of people. I don't think CISPA is the right solution. I don't think it's really well written in a lot of ways. I'm also a big fan of making sure law is written properly because, yes, it can be fixed in the judicial system, but you don't want to be the one on the wrong side of the first couple times that law goes through court. Um, and a lot of people in this community know that. but. I've seen enough, and I think if other people out there who are playing defense, especially in larger sectors, um, there is no way we're going to solve this with just technology. Technology will be staunching the bleeding and staying actions, but to really solve a nation state level actor coming at you with hundreds or thousands of employees that are sitting on every day going, own you, type trip now, over and over again, there's no technology that's going to stop that. That has to be laws and sanctions, all this geopolitical stuff that we don't want to deal with. But realistically, we're just going to be churning over and over again. And so in conclusion, in sharing this information and getting stuff out there, we're better educating everyone. And we need to extend it outside our community. Um, with the whole SOPA and PIPA stuff, it was very funny seeing like people like, you know, love him or hate him, Dan Kaminsky was over talking to congressmen. And you know, Josh Corman and some other people I know were there. And it's funny because they were talking to these people and they're like, the congressman had no idea they were doing anything that was inappropriate. Like, Why is everyone so angry? This lobbyist just came in and told me to sign this thing. Sounds great. Well, it's because there's a special interest group promoting an agenda. We need to find a way to promote our agenda, get it to people who can actually do stuff, like write laws and change things. And if we don't have the information out there to accurately depict what's going on and show what the problem is, not even going to be able to have, have, start the conversation. All right, I'll stop ranting. Can you, somebody throw me a move ball, please? <laughs> I, I didn't bring one. I wait, wanna, wait, 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 wait. I can't believe you didn't get Bean for saying some of that stuff. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got one here. It's still flinchy. <laughs> God damn. Here, here. Oh, you can move. There we go. OK, solve that problem. All right, that was um, a lot to right. digest. Sorry. Man. No, it's OK. Sorry. <laughs> Silly panelists for giving us something to think about. Um, on a Sunday, yeah, exactly. The hungover day. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get the ball rolling here and see if I can uh, I can uh, get a fight to break out. Um, I'm struck by uh, the we'll, and we'll go to questions um, here in two seconds. We're gonna have somebody running around with a mic, correct? Todd, Todd, Todd's got a mic. So there's a gentleman there with a, a fancy vest, and he'll be the first person to ask a question. So um, I don't know if it's a fancy vest. It may not even be a vest. I'm having a hard time seeing. So. Um, it strikes me that there's some, uh, you know, the, in the IT space, there's a long history of protecting our networks you know, at the global level, uh, the BGP route tables, the big providers, um, and the work that they've done to share threat information and keep BGP together in the face of, uh, you know, I guess, what tech kind of technology worked 30 years ago when it was designed, but certainly in the face of a dedicated adversary wouldn't be that great today. And they've responded operationally. Right? We've got a lot of tools, got a lot of guys, but the, the trust model there is a very small group of people who know each other. They get together all the time. They recognize each other by you know, face. You know, they, they, they probably you know, hang out at their houses, whatever. It's, there's a lot of trust involved. And that's just to keep something that's the only purpose of a network provider is to provide the network. Right? Um, and so they're protecting their core, their core products by doing that. When you look at other enterprises that have other missions that aren't just IT related, oh. banks, energy sector, and that kind of thing, this stuff starts to come out of hide, right? It's a, it's a tax that you have to pay to participate in. There's way more actors. As you point out, you've got people in Peoria, you know, who are maintaining everything and plowing the roads. Right. Um, and at the same time, you've got massive energy consortiums and they're trying to somehow share information. So um, I guess, you know, what's the, What's the path to go from something that like, you know, Nanog and some of these, you know, informal network sharing things where there's a lot of trust and we're willing to share, you know, just setting standards and saying, hey, there's a structured way to give away the keys to your kingdom. You know, that's, 
a cynical way to look at it, but I mean, that's how a lot of people are going to view it, especially at an executive level. You get people who might buy into this wholeheartedly, and some people would be staunchly against it. What's the value proposition for sharing information, especially given the speed at which these attacks happen, and that some of this information is a trailing indicator of an attack, vice actually making a more defensible network? And I know you'll argue with that, um, but really, why would I even want to share information? It, it, does it really make me more secure, or is it just spending money? I mean, that, the point's already been made, but I'll, I'll hammer it here for a second. It's, it's about the economics of attack. And right now, uh, we are in a world where they get to hurt us repeatedly across our sector, and we just take it. And if there's a way for us to figure out how to get hurt on one side and then fix the rest of it before it can hurt us again, that's a smarter way of doing business. I mean, we do it in all sorts of other pursuits. I mean, in the um, health arena, you know, if we have a, nest, a West, uh, uh, West Nile outbreak, it's not like the community just goes, oh, well, that sucks for us. They, they talk amongst, and, and then the actions start get taken. You can actually manage crises if you know in advance that it's coming. And, and we're, we're, that, that, so that's the motivator. So the question is, how do we get there? And, and, and I think we get there by starting with some very, very specific use cases. And we set ground rules that allow us to understand under what conditions we will share and, and how far that information is going to get out because we also have to care about the information that we are, 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 are pushing out. I'm not going to share information if I think the organizations that I'm sharing with are going to do bad things with that information to me. So I need to have a certain amount of faith that they are going to have a certain amount of, of, of rules that they will enforce amongst themselves when I give them my, my data. And by the same token, if I take their data, I have a responsibility as well because I'm not going to be liable for data that I give out to the community to help the community. But at the same time, you know, we need to understand what the value of that information is as it flows out and across that infrastructure. But, but the, 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 the core of it is, is if we can't figure out how to do this, we're never going to change the economic curve. And right now, the curve is not in our favor. Briefly add. So, so really, our ability to, to take action is defined by our scope of situational awareness, where, where we can see. And if, no matter who you are, no matter what size of organization, you know, the NSA only has a certain boundary of scope of what they can see. So to use a really cheesy analogy, when you think about the weather forecast you look at at night, or you, when you look at the map and you, you're from the D.C. area and you see, oh, look, this is the temperature in Columbia, and this is the temperature in Leesburg, and this is the temperature in Springfield and Richmond or whatever, that stuff doesn't come from space. That's basically individual weather stations located all around the place. And if you have one of those at your house, you might know what the temperature is, the barometric pressure at your house. But if you want to actually have an idea that there's a storm coming at you, you need to have all those things sharing together. And it's, it's a cheesy analogy, but that's the same thing with cyber, right? You, our, our goal would be for, <laughs> I said cyber, damn, damn. First um, one, first one. Uh, our, our goal there is that my detection becomes your prevention. So hey, it's something got hit with me. Can I share that so that before it ever even gets to you, can you do something about it? And the only way you can do that is to look beyond the horizon to be able to see what other people are seeing. Because you, you, your scope, no matter how big, especially for the small guys, the small guys don't have the capabilities to even look beyond their front door, let alone their yard. So you have to have that sharing to be able to see what's coming, to see what's out there, to be able to understand and actually take some actions. Uh, you know, thinking about the kill chain, you know, if, if all we do is think about things after the exploits happen, you're always cleaning up messes. Your only ability to get pre-exploit in the kill chain is if you're actually sharing information of what's been seen before. Because you only see it in your own places when it's happened. But if somebody else sees it and then they share it to you, you can actually do something before it happens to you. So, so and I have, I have a question counter back to Bruce. Sure. You say we're giving away the keys of the kingdom. How is information about threat actors keys of the kingdom? Our intellectual property is the keys of the kingdom. People are taking that and walking off with that on a regular basis. I mean, if I'm sharing something about a new piece of malware, that might be intellectual property to a company that does intelligence work. But outside of that, that's something that everybody else is going to be, you know, be able to use for their defense. Um, I mean, I understand there's the worry about liability admitting that you got breached, but that's a fight we've been having for a while and we're kind of losing anyways. I don't see how it's, quote unquote, the keys to the kingdom or even honestly something that's directly related toward most people's mission of how they make money to be able to give some information about how somebody just took a chunk out of their side. And I'm not going to respond because I'm going to go to a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice deflection. Thank you. So I can speak to that question and also to your flu outbreak question. Threat intelligence is a competitive advantage and intellectual property for certain companies. Some of them have been around for a while, some of them are just coming up right now. And it's to their advantage to hold on to that information and then sell it out to a variety of consumers. Work with an ISAC, they don't sell it. 
I understand that. And I work for a big four consulting firm, and I'm working, struggling with this internally, and I'm actually sharing with people sort of informally, and I may go home and not have a job because I just said that. But CrowdStrike, iSight Partners, things like that, that Intel is a competitive advantage for them. They want to sell that information to their consumers. How do we deal with that? So, and so just I, so you know, that the ones you just named are part of the community. I, I understand. I'm partnering with them, and they've seen me talking up in the community. Well, so here's the thing. I mean, I, I work for a vendor you could possibly lump in that thing. I mean, we, we do things in a slightly different manner. And I mean, the thing is, there is a productization of you not having the resources to completely address a problem. Um, are you going to roll your own antivirus solution 10 years ago? Are you going to write the engine that's going to monitor the operating system? Or are you going to, going to buy a commodity product? Realistically, you're going to see commodity. I mean, RSA this year is going to be 25 different threat intel companies saying, look, we have a new thing. It will solve this year's version of the APTs. But the thing is, like, ultimately, it has to be commoditized to be spread out there. But there needs to be a research and sharing phase. And I, I, I don't deny that you're going to have companies that make money off of this. I mean, basically, our customers benefit from the fact that we have intelligence. We share it internally. And that's what makes some of our stuff go. But at the same time, just because there are companies making money off of it doesn't mean that you don't want to help your neighbor put their house out because it's on fire. And most of the sharing that's going on is specific trusted groups like ISACs, which are industry specific. You have something in common. You have some reason to protect this. Because, yeah, there is a profit motive for some companies. There's definitely going to be business. But you know what? Those companies make money off of that. Not going to run out of customers anytime soon. And the challenge which we have faced right now, it's the first time, I think, in a long time since like a world war, the United States is going, holy crap, this is actually bigger than capitalist competition. Because you know what? If you have three companies in the US competing in a market space, and they all lose to somebody who's not in the United States, guess what? They all lost. And people are starting to, starting to have that light bulb go on. So it, it, it's small, but that's why we're doing things like this and, and, and jumping up and down in our seats, at least I am, is because we're trying to make people aware of the scope of this. And even the people who definitely make money off this on a regular basis, most of them, at least we do, can see some altruism. This is why we open sourced our way of depicting this information. This is why we go out and talk about it. Yeah, we make money off of what we do. Part of that is intelligence-based, but we also try and drive the community forward. And I'm also sitting here going, not running out of customers anytime soon, but you all can help yourselves in an independent manner. So, so, so I guess there's a, there's a question about the difference in the model between a peer-to-peer -peer sharing of information amongst community members, and I'll define it in this case for people who don't stand to make a buck, the people actually who are suffering, the individual organizations that are being hacked into and things, vice a centralized uh, brokered model where, you know, you mentioned AV, oh, you said your AV, you know, I got hit by a virus, I sent it to my AV company, I got hit by something else, I sent it to my IDS company or my spam company or whatever. Well, it's a company you have a formal contractual relationship with, right? And that provides legal top cover and all kinds of other protection versus all singing kumbaya by exchanging XML documents in the, in the open, right? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I think, nice to think that that could work. Um, but, I mean, do you really see a model where it's peer-to-peer -peer and people just share information in absentia of the people, the middleman making a buck and brokering and providing yeah, I mean, the top cover? It happens now. It just happens unofficially. That's yeah. what the ISECs and the they Well, can do. you scale it? Well, the ISECs well, have to, though. Yeah. I mean, but, like, and, and, critical and infrastructure, like, it's, it's exactly it. That's his job. We talk to medium-sized companies who are just, they do other things and they don't run power plants and they don't build cars. You know, they're not as important. Well, I mean, for example, you had, you know, you had Bro IDS mentioned here earlier this morning. You had to talk about that. There are open source projects which are easily consumable to help people with security. That's why I'm saying there needs to sort of be a snort for indicators of compromise. Um, because there are going to be smaller organizations that need to be able to consume this data. I mean, so I think that you, know, you, you do have several different models. Some of them are going to work really well for corporations that want to make money. Some of them are not going to be able to partake of that. But if you have people generating actionable intel, and you build a variety of things from a very high-end Cadillac, costs a lot of money product to something that's open source and you can just stand it up, everyone in there can benefit from having that in a standardized yeah. format. I mean, did you want to say Yes, yeah, so the, the, there's the, the problem of consuming the data, which is a big uh, tool-based, uh, procedural-based, just it covers everything. But you also have the, the question of do, do, do the companies even action the information because they do they know what it is? Do they know uh, that that MD5 is actually linked to something of a broader context, right? So what I try and focus on the ISAC is to try and provide that additional context. 
So an MD5, has that been seen before? Yes, it has been seen before in these sectors and it also has these other indicators attached. You probably want to look for these other indicators. Uh, the value add is not the data, it's trying to generate context and, and other information out of that. So I, the, I thought the question was really more focused on, you know, this, this commercial model that you've got, and you've got all these people who are going to be making money by aggregating, you know, collecting and aggregating and then publishing this data. And, and I think that's fine. The, the, the problem from, from an organization like ours is that, you know, how do you evaluate all these different data sources and how do you figure out which ones are actually bringing you value? There's a certain sense that it, it well, w wait a second, I just got a bunch of indicators of compromise from these guys, didn't we submit those? I mean, so, uh, you know, it, I think that we need to keep these organizations honest, which means that we have to have a way of fairly evaluating them and, and, and really uh, what kind of impact they're actually having and helping us uh, protect our networks. But we also need to make sure that this information gets into standard formats so that I don't get locked into a particular vendor based on the regular type of technology encumbrances. We really need to deal with the data. If they're bringing me good data that I can take good intelligent actions from, I'm happy to pay, but I just don't want to pay for data I'm giving them, and I don't want to have to bring on a fifth or a sixth vendor just to get to one more nine of performance. Question. So uh, my question would be, I feel like if you get into this information sharing model, there's going to be pressure for it to get really big, and a lot, a lot of people participating in the sharing. How do you plan to keep, with how agile attackers are, how do you plan to keep them from getting eyes into the information that you're sharing, seeing how you've identified how they're attacking you and making changes to their attack model before anyone who you're sharing the information with can implement your protections, and then also coming back on you because they now understand how you defended against them. Just use fax machines for sharing. <laughs> like, Out of yeah, but I mean, if you get really big and you have a lot of people participating, so the data the has a certain value, which I think of what we've been talking about, and how do you protect that information, and how do you protect an analyst who isn't necessarily treating that information as he should? That's a that's a problem, right? But it, it's that's a good problem to have. If we're making the the bad guys think uh, that they have to modify their uh, procedures, their tools, or whatever then we've actually slowed them down. Even if they know that we know that, they, they have to pause, rework what they're doing, and then launch another tech. It's that means we have more time to do other things. That, that, that's a good thing. It, it's denying territory and resources. And, and ultimately, yeah, I mean, it, that's why, again, technology never gets an answer. It's just kind of an arms race. But if you can multiply the defensive arms race times the number of people in your sharing organization, it's a, it makes, it's a lot harder if a guy has to go back and like get the people, you know, if you have 10 guys launching permutated malware by running a script and they just have to change the MD5, no biggie. If you have to go back to your developer and be like, you have to change all the libraries you're using because we see all of them when it's running in memory and you have to go back and rewrite the malware from scratch, that's a lot more man hours and time that have been taken out of that organization that's attacking you on a regular basis. Two points on this one. So one is that. So how do we get to more rich indicators, right? So it's not just the MD5. How, how hard is it for somebody to switch an IP when they discover you know the IP? You know, it's instantaneous and free. But if you can actually understand how they're behaving and link things together and force them to change, like, as Doug just said, the way they did that thing, that's, you're, you're pushing the economy. The asymmetry begins to invert, right? The other thing is, is please don't take what we're saying to say that this is a monolithic thing, that, oh, once it's sharing, it's, there's one sharing picture of everything. The, that's almost certainly not going to be the case ever because of some of the sensitivities and political issues. This is different communities sharing different kinds of things. Some of it's peer-to-peer, -peer, some of it's source subscriber, some of it's hub and spoke for infirmary and stuff, and how those communities share together and cross and stuff. And there's not really a monolithic picture. You're going to decide what you want to share with who. You're going to want to try and tag that data so that you know it goes to you, but it doesn't go to anybody else. You're not allowed to reshare it. So there's just because we're talking about visibility across a lot of things doesn't mean that any one player has all that visibility. And actually, just to add to that. So we see attacks that happen in a particular sector. That sector begins m mitigation, they respond, they learn from it, right? Th those same indicators could uh, maybe perhaps be seen in another sector. So they just reuse, if those sectors were communicating, then 
both sectors would have been uh, in a better position. We'll get to your question in two seconds. So I, I want to comment on something that you said. Um, you, you indicate if we could just share more robust indicators beyond just, you know, IP addresses and things, and we start to respond to actions, then, then you know, we can make their life difficult. Well, responding to actions on the enterprise is, is, is much more difficult than responding to an IP. It's the same problem. When, you know, I fight against or you know, on a network that's active intrusion going on, and I have to deal with their TTP at that time, Time, it takes a lot of effort to readjust architecture, to change product, to do whatever it is to address that TTP. And while it's expensive for them to adjust their TTP, uh, you know, based on my defenses, it's really expensive for me to adjust my business on the fly to do something differently to defend against an action. So sharing that abstract information, from my eyes, just gives me more frickin' work to do. Right? But like, it's it, so if, much more that I have to do, and I have other things I need to do, like run the business. But if, if you have... so. And this is something most people don't have, but if you have a mature incident response capability that's powered by <laughs> intelligence. Who has a mature incident response capability? And, and we're not saying that... that, that Good, that was so, one percent for those so, but, that... Uh, so here's the thing. We're, we're not there yet, but you could go back to when spam was destroying everybody's internet years ago. And you're like, oh, this is a horrible problem. We'll never be able to solve it. We're several years out from somebody having incident responder in a box. Eventually someone will have it five years from now and we'll be on to whatever the next problem is. This is the ugly sausage oh, making start. Incident responder in a box. This is the ugly sausage making start now that we're at. I think that's called what the department we, slave labor. I don't think that that's the solvable, automatable. I'll, I'll check back with you in five years. Excellent. So the other thing, you're, you're, I want to see the product. It's forcing us to change your defensive perspective. Hey, it, the stuff's going on today, right? It's yeah. just a matter of whether you know it's going on. And so when we're talking about more robust indicators, we're saying visibility of seeing those things that are going on to force them to change stuff. It doesn't, that's not increasing anything of what's actually happening necessarily. It's just increasing our ability to do something about it. Fair enough. Right? Re results drive investment. And if you have better data that people can use to create better programs, that's going to drive investment in better, you know, uh, you know, SOCs, it's better incident response. If you don't have that data, it's really hard to make the case to increase those teams. That's fair. All right. Question. I think one of the things that we're conflating here, though, is the idea of data, information, and intelligence, which are three separate layers of the same problem. We have more data than we know what to do with. Finding information from that is hard. And then taking it to the steps that you and Marty are working on and actually providing intelligence. How does this apply to my network? And that's not something that we can just take and give to people. They actually have to have the time, the energy, the mature organization to be able to apply that. And I think we're, again, at least five years. And so, so that's one of the things I want to go back to the community on. Because you know what? We have a lot of people who've solved a lot of big data problems. This is, again, one of those things where, so yeah, I mean, we can't have a true incident responder in a box. There always needs to be a human making some of the decisions because they're still, no, there, there is. Like, let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. The, but here's what you can do is, in many cases, if you look like what we've done to innovate computer science to have humans empowered is we have a mess that humans do all the manual work. And then over time, we figure out ways to automate all the BS and all the repeatable things up until the point that the specialized human can actually do their job at a practical level. We just need to apply a lot of the other computer science to this intelligence thing. We have huge amounts of data. I and mean, that's one of the problems that a lot of government agencies have is they've, they've gotten all of this SIGINT, they've got huge amounts of data, and they're now trying to figure out what to do with it. What are they doing? They're investing in the same large data analytics that Amazon and various other people are doing. They're looking at Hadoop, and they're looking at all these other technologies that like look at really massive stuff and figure out how to make things out of it. So instead of sitting there going, look, I found another way to bust an Adobe product, start taking some of your hacker know-how and putting it towards like, here's a whole pile of intelligence data. How could I make this useful to people and so they can consume it? And ultimately, what you will do, I mean, so right now, we have a problem that a lot of the products out there, they take people who have IR and they empower them. We don't have a lot of products out there that help people who don't do security learn how to do security. That's what I mean by IR in a box. And ultimately, you will still need people. But right now, if you're like small organization, you need to hire five IR personnel, they're like, ah. If five years from now you're like, hey, small organization, your sysadmin needs to attend two days of training to learn how to use this product and you'll have this new capability, they're like, yeah, sold, sign up, $50,000, sure, take it. We're, we're, we're at the beginning of trying to get there. So that problem is definitely I think you not, need to add another digit to, to the number of years. The maybe, more, the more maybe, we can apply automation, but, the closer we get. Right. Because you can move from data information with automated heuristics and then let, let the people focus on the intel part. So uh, we're going to take this. Are you ready for this to be the last question, sir? This is, this is one of those like home run kind of like, not to put pressure on you, but this is what we're, people are going to remember this entire panel 
based on your question. Awesome. <laughs> I'm Gary. My question has to do with assisting the attackers. If you, if you put all your threat information together, it seems like this could it would help all the people trying to defend their networks, but also helps all the people who are trying to break into them know how to avoid your detection. So I'm wondering if you guys have ideas about how to, how to mitigate that threat. So it's you know, the problem with virus total, right? I mean, and this is just now we're talking about much more abstract concept of virus total. It's, you know, you've got your little discrete indicators, observables in virus total space, and you, we think adversaries use virus total to check their stuff or similar products. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So, um, again, when you codify all this and people get compromised, you, you've, you, and this is what I was kind of referring to, keys to the kingdom. It's not that the keys to the kingdom of how to build a better car. It's the fact that you lay bare, here's what I am able to consume and produce. Yeah, but you don't necessarily lay all of it bare. I mean, that's the thing is like what, there, there's going to be different tiers of intelligence. Anyone who has a really good intelligence mining capability is always going to keep their best stuff close hold. My and data then, set is not public, by the then, way. Then there, then there is a. <laughs> well, to the general the public. Thing. There that's is why a, the there, amps are working right now. There is a the range sector that goes from what you have close in to what is generally publicly available that is still useful that you'll part with. But nobody's ever going to share their closest secrets. The trick is figure out what in the middle you can either share or use or sell or give out to people. And so, yeah, you are giving out information to attackers. If I publish an IOC that says, here's what we found this piece of malware, the bad guys could look at it and go, yes, okay, now I know that that's there. But to me, the important part about this to learn is that we have this idea, we've had for a long time, you buy a preventative product, you throw some money in the business cases, you've prevented that problem. Bullshit, doesn't work, hasn't worked for a long time, never going to be there. It's about managing the fact that people are always going to be breaking in, figuring out how you can kick them out, move along, and get back to a status quo, or accept the damage that you're gonna get as fast as possible. So it's managing a process of intrusion rather than trying to stop it cold. And sharing information is one of the ways of managing it by making their tools less effective. They will come with the next one, you'll have to do it again, and so on and so on and so forth. But it's much better to accept that's a managed process and do it and build it into your business than think I can spend $100,000 on an appliance and poof, the APTs is gone. I think that is a good place to stop. So um, thank you very much, panelists. Appreciate your time.